Listen in on this week's Scientific American 60 Second Science Podcasts. I'm podcast editor Steve Mursky. Aside from all the satellites and the space station orbiting the Earth, there's a lot of trash circling the planet, too. 21,000 baseball-sized chunks of debris, according to NASA. But that number is dwarfed by the number of small particles. There's hundreds of millions of those. And those smaller particles tend to be going fast. So if you think of picking up a grain of sand um, at the beach, and that would be on the large side (laughs) of what we're worried about. But they're going 60 kilometers per second. Sigrid Close, an applied physicist and astronautical engineer at Stanford University. Close says that whereas mechanical damage, like punctures, is the worry with the bigger chunks, the dust-sized stuff might leave more insidious, invisible marks on satellites by causing electrical damage. We also think that this phenomenon can be attributed to some of the failures and anomalies we see on orbit that right now are basically tagged as unknown cause. Close and her colleague Alex Fletcher modeled this phenomenon mathematically based on plasma physics behavior. And here's what they think happens. First, the dust slams into a spacecraft incredibly fast. It vaporizes and ionizes a bit of the ship and itself, which generates a cloud of ions and electrons traveling at different speeds. And then it's like a spring action. So the electrons are being pulled back to the ions. Ions are being pushed ahead a little bit. And then the electrons overshoot the ions. So they oscillate and then they go back out again. That movement of electrons creates a pulse of electromagnetic radiation, which Close says could be the culprit for some of that electrical damage to satellites. The studies in the journal Physics of Plasmas. The implications of these small particles on the future of spaceflight is huge. One of my dreams is interstellar travel, so I love Star Trek. I, I grew up like hoping I could build something to get outside our solar system, and I feel like this is just one, one of the many things that we have to worry about. Um, I think the space environment as a whole is still something that we need to tackle. Before it tackles any astronauts a long way from home. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. May 18th is the 37th anniversary of the massive explosion of Mount St. Helens, but within days of the volcano erupting, the local ecosystem started to bounce back, thanks to some unassuming little animals that spend lots of time underground. The pocket gophers were the ecological heroes of Mount St. Helens. Emory University paleontologist and geologist Anthony J. Martin. You normally don't hear those words put together, pocket gopher and hero, but they were. These small burrowing mammals were able to survive this massive, devastating volcanic eruption. Just as numerous animals that live underground have survived catastrophes and predators for hundreds of millions of years, as Martin discusses in his new book, The Evolution Underground, Burrows, Bunkers, and the Marvelous Subterranean World Beneath Our Feet. The reports I was reading about this, about how these researchers in helicopters are flying over the devastated landscape, just a few days later, there were the burrow mounds. Pop, pop, pop. Thinking about these gophers that were below the ground, and they survived that. So that, to me, was a golden opportunity to talk about that as this incredible story of survival, but also renewal, that these little burrowing mammals brought back that landscape because their burrows served, first of all, as refuge for any other small animals that were there. So of the small mammals and other vertebrates, such as amphibians and reptiles that lived there, they were either in their own burrows or they were in pocket gopher burrows or other small mammal burrows in the area. The burrowing also brought up seeds. The seeds are already buried, so that caused plants to start sprouting in the area where it wasn't so much wind-blown seeds. Then, of course, once other animals started coming back into the area like elk and they started dropping seeds through their feces and otherwise affecting the surface ecology, that then worked together to bring those ecosystems back to life. But the gophers were key in this. They really were essential for these ecosystems to be able to bounce back. You can hear an extended interview with Martin about his book in a Science Talk podcast posted on our website. And there's a children's book just about the gophers in Mount St. Helens called Gopher to the Rescue by Terry Jennings. Finally, for general information about gophers and their effect on landscapes, 
Check out the nature documentary Caddyshack. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. You can thank your parents for your DNA, because humans share genes through sexual reproduction, passing DNA from parent to child. It's known as the vertical transfer of DNA. Now imagine if you could share just one or two bits of your DNA with an unrelated stranger, through a handshake or other incidental contact. And that stranger inserted your DNA into their genome. No sex, no offspring either. That's called the horizontal transfer of DNA. It's obviously not how humans do it, but it's a mainstay of single-celled organisms like bacteria, which use the process to share antibiotic resistance genes, for example. And now French scientists have found that horizontal DNA transfer could be a lot more common than we thought in multicellular organisms too, insects in this case. Because by analyzing 195 insect genomes, they found more than 2,200 cases of this horizontal DNA transfer between unrelated species of flies and butterflies, beetles, and wasps. That total quadruples the number of horizontal DNA transfers previously described in all plants, animals, and fungi. The studies in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. How exactly this genetic transfer happens is still a mystery. It might be viruses or parasites doing the DNA delivery. But whatever the cause, it suggests that the evolution of insects, on a molecular level at least, may be something more of a shared success story. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Charles Darwin is most famously the author of The Origin of Species, but the last book he ever wrote gets far less attention today. It's called The Formation of Vegetable Mold Through the Action of Worms. And earthworms were a passion. He wrote about their habits, their soil-tilling abilities. He even kept pots of worm-filled soil in his study. But his fascination was met with ridicule by some. There's a famous cartoon where... You know, Charles Darwin as an old man is in the middle and he evolves from monkeys because of his evolutionary theories and the monkeys evolve from earthworms. Olaf Schmidt is a soil ecologist at University College Dublin and not among those who would criticize Darwin for his interests. I love earthworms. Yeah, earthworms are brilliant. They're our friends. They're really important. One particularly interesting group of worms, he says, are the so-called anisic worms, the deep soil dwellers. And they live all their life in a single vertical channel in the soil. And at night, they surface. Looking for food, manure, straw, stuff like that. And they pull it into their channels. They're big boys, which makes them especially vulnerable to the plow. You know, they are so big, so they are chopped. They are exposed you know, to birds and so on. And also their channels are destroyed. Schmidt and his colleague, Maria Brionis, analyzed the relationship between tilling and the health of a dozen species of earthworms. They looked at 65 years' worth of farm field studies spanning the globe. And they found that in heavily plowed fields, half the earthworms had disappeared. But when farmers switched to no-till or conservation agriculture, worm populations wriggled back to normal numbers after about a decade. The studies in the journal Global Change Biology. The plow, Darwin wrote, is one of the most ancient and most valuable of man's inventions. But long before he existed, the land was in fact regularly plowed, and still continues to be thus plowed, by earthworms. And Schmidt says, just as the worms look after the soil, the flip side's true too. If you look after the soil, you also look after the earthworms, you know, so it is a good news story. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. <laughs>